turn this over, the service over to our own Mother Riley, who is going to introduce um, our speaker for this morning. Let's say amen as she comes. Amen. Rapture call. Thank the Lord. So good to be in the house with the Lord this morning. And we are honored to have our First Lady of Harris Memorial to be our speaker in the person of Missionary Sherry Riley. And she is a wonderful, wonderful young woman in the Lord. And she is a wonderful, wonderful pastor's wife. And so we thank God for her. And so we're going to present to you at this time we're going to ask you to stand as she comes forth, and I want her to stand up on the top so you all can see her. Amen? Amen. I present to you First Lady Sherry Riley. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this, another opportunity to speak a word to your people, O oh God. I ask that you remove self now, O oh God, and you take control of the service, O oh God. You word my mouth, not my will, but thy will be done in the service on today, O oh God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Ooh, I'm nervous. But God is good, and he did give me a word on today to give to you and I just ask God to open up your hearts to receive what the Lord has prepared for you on today giving honor to God who is my life and to our bishop and mother Riley to our own pastor my husband pastor Paul Riley and to mother Dean in her absence and all you saints and friends if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis I gave Sierra a little bit of my topic, and she said to me this morning, Mom, it was hard not to go to your scripture. I said, you better stay away from, for, away from my scripture now. And she did such a wonderful job. The Bible says to train them up and the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart. Genesis verse 39, chapter 39, verse 5 to 9 reads, And it came to pass from the time that he hath made him overseer of his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for, jo for Joseph's sake. And the blessings of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And it came to pass that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wrought not what is with me in this house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do such great wickedness and sin against God? My topic on this morning is, that wasn't designed for me. A quick history of Joseph. Joseph was the second youngest son of Jacob, and he was his favorite. Joseph's brothers, of course, were jealous of their brother. And Joseph was given prophetic dreams from God. And Joseph shared his dreams to his brother, and it, it tells that they would bow down to Joseph. And of course, how many know that misery loves company? And so they plotted together, Joseph's brothers did, and to make a long story short, they took him out into the woods and they sold him into slavery. And they took his coat and put some animal blood on it and brought it back to their father and said that Joseph had been killed. And so his father mourned him. And so Joseph was sold into slavery and was bought by Potiphar. And Potiphar found favor in Joseph. And Joseph was the head of the servants. He was over all the servants. And so Potiphar had a wife. Mm -hmm. 
The Bible says she's Potiphar's wife. Doesn't give her a name. And Potiphar's wife was three things. She was rich, she was bored, and she was idle. And how many know that an idle mind is the devil's territory? The devil loves when you are doing nothing. To be idle means you are doing nothing. And when you are doing nothing, the devil can speak to you, and there's no distractions. He can speak to you, and because you're doing nothing, those things that he's telling you, although they're not true, you begin to believe that they're true, because why? You're doing nothing. Things, you begin to see things that aren't even there. Oh, so-and-so just walked past me. Did you see her walk past? Oh, she must have something against you. And because you're not busy praising God, because you're not busy in your hands with things to do for God, you begin to say, hmm, she did just walk past me. I don't know who the, she thinks she is, or I don't know who they think they are. But when you are not busy, the devil is really speaking to your mind, and you are registering it. And with Potiphar's wife sitting idle, she began to look at Joseph like Eve looked at that forbidden fruit. She began to have eyes for Joseph. And because she was so rich, when you have money, you tend to think that you have everything and you can have everything. And so she came to Joseph, and she came strong to him. And he said, wait a minute. Wait one minute. Do you know who I am? He says, I am. There's nobody greater in this house than I. There is nothing that has been held from me except you because you are Potiphar's wife. So he shot her down, and it, it's very interesting to me because the devil, I mean, the Bible never gave her a name. They just said that she was Potiphar's wife. She was designed for Potiphar. The Bible did not give us instructions to who her name was, and that reminded me of the Garden of Eden, and uh, God told Adam, you can have anything in this garden except you cannot eat the fruit from that tree. Anything else is yours but the fruit of that tree. We say it's an apple, but the Bible never said what kind of fruit it was. It doesn't matter what kind of fruit it was. We were to refrain from eating the fruit of that tree. And Potiphar's wife was not for Joseph. She was not designed for Joseph because she was Potiphar's wife. And so Potiphar's wife says, oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to fix her. I'm going to fix him. I am who I am, and I'm going to wait till the mood is set just right. And do you know that when the devil tries to come and present something to you, he tries to present it in a package that will tempt you to will you, where you will find it very, very hard to resist. So she made sure she waited until there was nobody home. All the servants were gone. Her husband was gone. The concubines were gone. There was nobody around. And no doubt she dressed for the occasion. No doubt her hair was just right. We know how we do women. You know she had that smelling uh, perfume on there. She was ready for him. And when he walked by, she grabbed his coat. And you know what Joseph did? As she grabbed his coat, he kind of got out of his cloak and ran. He ran not just out of the room, he ran out of the house. And the God is trying to say that when sin presents himself to you, you don't dibble-dabble, you don't entertain it, you run. You run and you go out the other way because it was not designed for you. Sin was not designed for you, my brothers and my sisters. And so it's a lustful thing. And lust has some characteristics. Lust is of the world. It's not of God. Lust makes us want it now. We don't want to wait. We are going to get it. We are going to get it now. We are impatient. Lust is selfish. It doesn't matter who it affects. You want it, and you're going to do everything to get it. Lust says to take it. It's not mine, but I'm going to get it. Lust is sinful. The Bible states that. Lust is immoral. It is of the flesh. And we know we have to have our flesh under subjection. And the lust is anxious. But the number one thing lust is not, lust can never be satisfied. You will never be satisfied if you are tampering with those things that God did not design for you to have or to be. And it made me think of the little shop of horrors. 
when they were starting to feed the plant. Did you guys ever see the movie or the play, The Little Plant? It was just little, and then it began to be fed, and it grew, and it grew, and it just kept saying, feed me, Seymour, feed me. And the more you feed lust, the more ferocious the appetite gets. When you start to dibble-dabble in sin, the more ferocious the appetite gets to continue in that sin and to go even deeper in the sin. And I began to think of all the falseness that the devil puts before us. And I think about sugar. Lord knows I struggle with the love of sugar. <laughs> but I think about sugar and those that have, um, that have diabetes or is trying to lose weight and refrain from sugar. Man has made a substitute for sugar. We call it the artificial sweetener. And they do it so that it will give you the taste, the illusion that you're having sugar, but it's not sugar. And the substitute, it is not healthy for you. It is not healthy for you. It is chemically made. Men got together. They have a laboratory, and they take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, stuff that you shouldn't even be putting in your body, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and they put it together, and they create something that makes it sound like or taste like it's sweet. And so you can kind of trick your body to think that you're having sugar. But the body is a very, 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 very smart machine that we have. And when you have your artificial sweetener, and if you see somebody who always uses that, a lot of times they're overweight. Because when you have sweetener, the body said, oh, sugar. And then it realizes, oh, that ain't sugar. I said, I want sugar. And so then you'll go and you'll go, you'll keep having, and the more you have, the more you want more. Why? Because it's not satisfying you, because it's not the real thing. <laughs> Artificial sweeteners, the chemicals that are in there, are not designed to be, con to be contained by a human being. And that is just like the sin that, that the devil puts before us. It is not real. The only thing that is real, the only thing that is satisfying is Jesus Christ. And if you don't know him for yourself, you need to get to know him because he is designed for you. And I'm getting way ahead of myself. And it, I thought about the, the song, what God has for me, it is for me. What God has for me, it is for me. And we sing that song, and we don't want to be in the position where we take whatever we want to take, whatever's presented for us. We want what God wants for us. And I know my children, whew, they hate when I use them as an examples, but as a mother, you raise your children to be, well, I'm raising my children to be God-fearing children, to be respectful, and to be upright citizens. And I let my children know, don't you bring just anybody up in this house to meet me and your father. I, you, you, I don't want no, no man that has been here, there, and everywhere, been dibble-dabbling and everything on drugs, this, that, the other. I don't want no woman that is half exposed talking about where's my boyfriend. Don't bring those type of people in my house because you are a prince and you are a princess. Who, my children are no special than your children. They are the children of the most high God. Yeah. They are royal priesthood. And I tell them, you do not settle for nonsense. Young people... Dating people that are not saved are not designed for you. You are not strong enough to bring them up and to make them be saved. That is God to change their heart. You are not the instrument to do it. You can be friends with them, but you are not to have a relationship with those that are not saved. They are not designed for you. We, when we had our uh, breakfast with the pastor, the young people, Sister Natasha said it great. She says it's so much easier, if you're up on the chair, it's so much easier for someone to pull you down than for you to bring them up on the chair. So know your spot and know that they are not designed for you. So back to Potiphar's wife, of course when you, when you don't give in to the devil, he gets mad and he tries to get even. So Potiphar's wife says, I'm going to fix him. I have his cloak because he left it in my hand. I have evidence. And she went and she said, he tried to rape me. I have the evidence. And so to make a long story short, Joseph was put in prison. And you could say, he did what the word of God says. He resisted the devil. But yet, when he was with his brothers, he was sold into slavery. But the, the Potiphar found favor him favoring him and made him head of the slaves. Then he was put in prison, but guess what? The prison keeper found favor in him. 
And so he had it made even in prison. And then in prison, he met Pharaoh's butler, chief butler, and his chief baker, and he began to interpret their dreams. And so as time went and the butler was back home with Pharaoh, Pharaoh began to have these dreams. And he couldn't remember them. And he says, what are these dreams that I'm having? And so then the butler remembered. He says, you know what? Back when I was in prison, there was a guy by the name of Joseph. And he interpreted my dreams, and he did it so accurately. And Pharaoh said, go get him. So he get him, and through prayer, Joseph was able to interpret his dreams. And the dream was interpreted as this. There is going to be seven years of bountiful crops, plenty, food for days. There's just going to be seven years of plenty. But then after that, there's going to be seven years of famine. There's going to be no food anywhere. So Pharaoh says, you know what? You're going to be second to command. You're second to me. I'm top, and then it's you, Joseph. And his job was to store up during those seven years of plenty, store up all the food so that when the seven years of famine comes, they would be prepared for it. And I got so excited because during the seven years of plenty, I got to thinking about us as saints of God. It is so easy to praise God when things are going good. It's so easy to praise God when money is in the bank. It's so easy to praise God when everyone's treating you right. It's so easy to praise God when you have food on your table and your bills are paid. But we need to, it's in those times we need to store up. When it seems like the blessings of God are just everywhere, it's the time that you store up. As Sister Sierra said, you pray, you worship, you praise, you store it up. So when those famine comes, and yes, Christians, women and men of God, those days will come when the devil or life happens to you and situations come in your life and you're going to be like, whoo, but you have it all stored up. Your strength is there. Your strength is there. So you want to be stored up. And so during those seven years of famine, and I really have to cut this part short because it's all, read what happens because Joseph's brothers come to him, be, well, come to Pharaoh because they need food because there's no food. Right. And so Joseph does some things to his brothers, and they didn't recognize who Joseph was, but it come to make full circle. They find out who he is, and he's reunited with his father, and yes, his brothers do bow down to him, just like God had promised and showed in his prophetic dreams. And everything goes full circle, full circle. If God promises it, it will come as long as you stay in the will of God, as long as you don't touch those things that God did not design for you, the promises that God has promised you, it will come to pass. Yes, you might have to go to prison. Yes, you might be in bondage, but God will have favor on your life no matter where he sends you. What the devil means for your bad, God always turns it around for your good. God can use horrible circumstances for your good, despite all the bad things that happened to Joseph, all the experiences that he had. It had to happen because he was able to save the lives of many during the seven years. So when you are down and out and you're saying, Lord, why me? Say to yourself, why not me? Because there is a reason why I'm here. God places you in situations to make you stronger, to make his word come to, be, to, come to pass. Because what he says is going to happen, God can do all things but lie. He does not lie. So you need to stand on the word of God. And there's a story that I told back down in ODF, Open Door Fellowship, our church in Amherstburg. And it fits along. And I know when pastor's done his sermon, he always has a story. So I have a story today. And there is this lady, she had come and bought a python, a pet python, just a little baby python. And I need to come down. It's just a little baby python. And she loved this pet. And this pet wasn't like any other snake. She didn't put it in an aquarium or anything. This pet, this snake had the run of, of the house. And so as time come, of course, the snake grew. The python began to grow. And she even slept. How many sleep with your dogs or your cats or whatever? Anybody? Some, I see some hands, they do. Well, she did that with the snake. She had the snake lying in bed with her. And as time went, the snake got really big. And as time went, she went to try and feed it, whatever if she feeds it, rats, mice, whatever, and the snake would not eat. And be because she loved her pet so much, she says, oh, 
Why isn't he eating? So she took that snake to the vet and said, doctor, can you look at my snake? This snake is not eating, and it always eats at least once a week. He sa she says, okay, well, you stay here. I'll go check out the snake. So he comes back. She said, nope, the snake is healthy. There's nothing wrong with the snake. Don't worry. When he's ready to eat, he'll eat. So she takes the snake home, and she's laying with it and petting it all down and you know, whoa, what's wrong with my snake? What's wrong with my snake? A couple weeks later, as she puts his arm around the snake, she noticed that the snake is fatter. She says, what's going on? There's something has got to be wrong with the snake because it's not eating, but yet it's getting fatter. So back to the vet it goes. And the doctor says, okay, I'll examine, I'll examine the snake. I'll let you know. And so she comes back. The doctor comes back and says, ma'am, I'm sorry to tell you, I have to put your snake down immediately. She says, I knew he was sick. I knew he was sick. What's wrong with him? She says, oh, no, no, no. That's, that snake is not sick. She's like, well, why do you want to kill him? Why? That's my pet. I love him. She says, well, you might love him, but didn't you say that he was sleeping up in your bed with you? Yes, yes, he is. Do you know that snakes aren't designed to be pets? Oh, yeah, but I just love him. She says, okay, well, I'll tell you what love does. While you're laying up, in that bed, that snake is not eating because that snake is preparing itself to eat something much bigger. And as you're sleeping, he's sizing you up, and he knows exactly how big you are. He knows how much you weigh. He knows how wide you are. He says, and he is only about two days away from consuming you as you're laying up beside it and sleeping with it. It is getting ready to swallow you whole. You, my dear, are its next meal. And that's what I want to come and tell you today. God said to tell you that some of us are toying with sin. We are doing things and being with people that are not designed for us to be. And God is saying that thing is so close to consuming you to destroying you. The devil comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And so this is a warning call. I don't know what it is, but there is a warning call. There are some things that we need to not be touching. There are some people we need not to be with. There are some things we do not need not to be consuming. There are things that we are doing that God did not design for you. And just like that snake who she loved was getting ready to devour her, that very thing that's in your life is getting ready to devour you. It's getting ready to devour you. But God says, I am a God of restoration, and I am a God of forgiveness. And anybody that comes to me, I will give you rest. And you might be thinking, you know what? I have been sitting here, and I have no idea why I am. my mind is going crazy. Everything in my life is in turmoil. Everything is in my – but who knows that God is a mind regulator, he will regulate your mind. He will turn that situation around. But you have to do your part. The devil has stole some things from you, some joy from you, some things that God has promised he has taken away from you. And it reminded me of the Thai tribute song, and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. And we need to stand up to the devil and let him know, yes, I've been through the storm and I've been through the rain, but I made it. And let him know. It says, if you only knew, old devil what I was going to be. After the storm, you wouldn't have even bothered me. Why? Because now I'm stronger. I got more power. And he goes, uh-huh. And I'm a little bit wiser, yeah. And I got more strength. I got God's anointing, his favor, and I'm still standing. I want it all back. How many of you want what, God ha what the devil has stole from you? How many want to stand on the word today and say, what you stole from me, I want it all back. Those things that weren't designed for me, I'm not touching them all. I want to only what God has designed for me. It goes on to say, what about your family and your self-esteem, even your destiny? Do you want it all back? What about the joy you tasted, the time you wasted? Do you want it back? What about your place in God and all your faith in God and even the ways of God? Do you want it back? What about your hopes and dreams and your communities? You know, our communities need some light, and we are the light of the world. It says even the hopes and dreams and your communities, 
even your kids and your teens. How many know that your kids might be running ragged? Don't you want to claim them back and say, they are my children? Devil, you can't have them. I want it all back. So my hopes and my dreams, my communities, my kids and my teens, I want it all back. I want what God has designed for me. I don't want what man has designed for me. For that leads to destruction. I want the promises of God. God has given us some awesome promises. And I am going to stand on the word of God. And I'm going to say, God, whatever you have for me, it is for me. And I want you to repeat these words after me. That wasn't designed for me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to do three. I'm going to offer three things to you on this morning. The first thing is if there's somebody here tonight or today, this afternoon, that is not saved, have not accepted the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ into your life, and you want to say, you know what? I have been searching for my happiness. I've been searching for my joy in all the wrong places. And I want to try Jesus. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he that trusteth in him. And you want to say, today is the day. I'm going to try Jesus for myself. I want the real thing. I don't want the artificial man-made things. I want the real thing. If that is you, put your hand up. You want to say, Lord, today's the day. The second one. I'm going to ask if if there's anybody here who has been dibble-dabbling, who has been accepting those things that God did not design for you, and you have seen it in your life. Your life is not where it should be because you haven't been heeding to God's word. You have been testing the things that haven't been designed for you, and you're saying no more, no more. The devil is not going to hold me in this bondage no more. I want it all back. Everything that the devil stole from me, I want it all back. If that is you, just raise your hand and put it down. The last one is you have been standing on the word of God. You have been like Joseph, and you have been resisting those things that have not been designed for you. But yet, you are in the prison state. And you're saying, Lord, why why me? Why me? And then you just realize today that God has you there for a strategic plan. But you need prayer for more strength. That you can continue to stand on the word of God. That you can continue to say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Is anybody here that just wants prayer for more strength? You're standing on the word of God. At this time, I am going to turn this part over, this prayer over to our pastor. And for those that, before I turn it over to him, when you came to church today, this is like the doctor's office, okay? When you are not feeling well, you either go to a clinic or you go to the hospital. Well, you're in the right place. This is the hospital. This is the doctor's office for those who are sick in their spirit who need more of God. You are in the right place. Listening to the word of God and putting your hand up and saying, Lord, I need prayer. That is where you're saying, give me the prescription. I want to be better. So we've done that. And so when I'm going to have those that raise their hands to stand for whatever prayer I asked for you to stand, when you're standing, you're saying, I'm taking the prescription. I know, I know this is the prescription. So now we're saying whatever you learn today, you know, when you get a prescription, it will say take two times a a day with food or take once a day at bedtime. When you leave here, the pastor can pray. God has opened up your hearts to receive, but now you have to do your part. And if you take that medicine home and you just sit it on the shelf and you don't take it, you will not be better. You have to take the prescription that God has given you. And God has great things in store, great things in store. Yes, life happens. Yes, hardships come. But as long as you stand on the word of God, as long as you stay with the things that God has designed for you, you will make it, and everything will come full circle. God bless. I turn it over into the hands of the pastor for prayer. 
While you're standing, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this word, a word that has pierced our hearts and our souls to a point, Lord, that we're standing today because we are in the need of prayer. I pray that every person that stood, God, that you would touch them now in the name of Jesus. Touch their situation, heal their disease, heal their sinful ways. Forgive them of them, Lord. Come in and change their hearts. If they want more of you, God, give them more of your spirit in the name of Jesus. And we thank you and we glorify your name. Amen and amen. Be seated just for a moment. Come on and give First Lady a great big round of God bless you.